Hi folks, this is Jay. Hope you're okay today. It's good to be with you. We're doing uh, Rudolf Bultmann uh, Part 2, and this is a resource for theology students, uh, seminarians, uh, priests, pastors, bishops, uh, theologians. Uh, it's just a little resource for you to either give your students or to uh, think about yourself. Uh, the source for uh, this chat and discussion is Rudolf Bultmann, um, Outstanding Christian Thinkers, David Ferguson, uh, pay, uh, uh, London and New York Continuum, and uh, it's 1992, um, reissued in 2000. So we'll be f reading a few quotes uh, from this book. Uh, the good thing about this book is it's got a good bibliography, uh, so that if you want to be a Bultmann scholar or do research it in a PhD or a master's, or if you are doing an essay on Bultmann, uh, there's a massive uh, bibliography and points you to, uh, there's a number of bibliographies uh, within this book for each chapter, and it points you to other resources for Bultmann scholarship. So, without further ado, let's uh, come before the Lord and ask his blessing. <clears throat> Father God, we thank you for this day, and we give you the praise and the glory and the honor. We thank you for your love and your grace, and uh, we thank you for your goodness and your blessings. And so, Lord, we come before you now, and we ask for your blessings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and for your glory, Lord. May you be honored, and may you be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, um, just to recap what we did um, in the first video, uh, we looked at a little bit about the life of uh, Rudolf Bultmann. We looked at the legacy of liberalism, and we looked at various influences such as Schleimacher and Rachel and Hermann and some of these liberal theologians that went into the influence of Rudolf Bultmann. And I, I did a backflip. I these scholars that I mentioned, I would do a critique of them. I did a critique of the Enlightenment, if you remember, but also made the point as um, Ferguson makes the point that the Enlightenment was at the heart of the liberal um, theological project. I made the point also that I'm a conservative evangelical and I do not agree with. Um, the theology of Bultmann, and I made that clear too. Now we're going to look at some really uh, important issues, and on page 50 we're going to look at the we're going to look at the hermeneutical task and then uh, the theology of the New Testament, and then the demythologizing program, and then basically just finish with a few Bultmann, uh, post Bultmann scholarship. Uh, so that's where we're at, okay? The hermeneutical task, uh, page 50 of uh, Ferguson's book. He says this hermeneutics is the science of the interpretation of written text. Traditionally, it referred to the rules governing grammatical forms and individual terms. By mastering these rules, it becomes possible to translate and to interpret an ancient text. In this sense, hermeneutics is restricted to the principles of informing philology. Then uh, Ferguson goes on to point out that uh, the Schleimacher added a new element to hermeneutics. It was not only about grammar. It was also seen that we had to get into the psychological makeup of a writer if we wanted to know what the writer actually said. So, uh, quote uh, Ferguson, uh, page 51, our understanding of a soliloquy or a headline is conditioned by our understanding of what the meaning of the whole text is. At the same time, our understanding of the whole can only be arrived at through the interpretation of the parts. There is thus an inevitable circularity in any process of interpretation. End of quote. Page 51, again at the end of the book, uh, end of the chapter, uh, end of the page, we read, the presuppositions that govern the interpretation can themselves be modified and transformed in the interpretive act. For this reason, the image of the hermeneutical spiral has sometimes been preferred to that of the circle. 
Nonetheless, the point remains that without some prior understanding on the part of the inquirer, the meaning of the text cannot be comprehended. And then there was uh, Wilhelm Dilthey, uh, 1833 to 1911, that continued the, the philosophical uh, reflection concerning hermeneutics and influenced um, Boltman. We read these words. Uh, I'll just get you the uh, reference for this. Uh, this is from the works of uh, selected passages of Dilthey's works H. A. Hodges, Wilhelm Dilthey, Routledge in Keegan, Paul, London, 1969, page 142. So this philosopher says this, it is through the process of understanding that life in its depths is made clear to itself. And on the other hand, we understand ourselves and others only when we transfer our own lived experience into every kind of expression of our own and other people's life. Thus everywhere, the relation between lived experience, expression and understanding is the proper procedure by which mankind as an object in the human studies exist for us. Uh, so that's uh, Dilthey, uh, the philosopher's uh, view on hermeneutics. Um, going further on on page 52, we read uh, from Ferguson who says, it is only from within a certain within a certain historical situation that a text can be interpreted and understood. The text itself belongs to another person's history and understanding that text may enable interpreters to reach a deeper understanding of their own historical existence. Now Bultmann uh, took Schleimacher, he took Dilthey and he took also uh, Heidegger and was influenced by he Heidegger. And in Ferguson's book, on page 53, we read, The questions that are put to the text will have a bearing upon answers that are discovered there. We read page 53, Like Dilthey and Heidegger, Bultmann constantly emphasized the importance of the historical nature of human existence. It is only the by participation and self-involvement in concrete existence that understanding can take place. Existential interpretation can occur by way of neutral detachment sorry existential interpretation cannot occur by way of neutral detachment or cold analysis it is only when interpreters are engaged personally with the basic questions of their existence that existential understanding can occur we read um, just get the source for this Uh, this is Problems of new Hermeneutics, I think it's um, Bultmann. The more subjective interpretation is the most objective, because the only person who is able to hear the claim of the text is the person who is moved by the question of his or own existence. Now we can't go into uh, a deeper analysis of of Bultmann's um, projects, hermeneutical task. But then again we can. Um, I think it's important to do that because hermeneutics is a, is a very important subject in any academic discipline. So I'm going to read a few more quotes. In Karl Barth's Epistle to Romans, we read, Calvin, having first established what stands in the text, sets himself to rethink the whole material and to wrestle with it till the walls which separate the 16th century from the first become transparent. Paul speaks and the man of the 16th century hears. The conversation between the original record and the reader moves round the subject matter until a distinction between yesterday and today becomes possible. Ferguson says, in reviewing this, Bultmann, although endorsing Barth's theological exegesis, insists that he has overlooked the, the extent to which Paul is a man of his time and therefore bears the influence of a wide range of beliefs and practices which belong to the first century but not to the 20th. 
in order to determine the valid existential meaning of Paul's word it is necessary to discriminate the spirit of Christ from the other spirits that are living in the writing and then page 58 it is necessary for the theologian to heed the work of the historical critic before presenting a theological interpretation of scripture the presupposition of historical inquiry is that the events of history from a causal continuum and can therefore be explained in terms of the context and circumstances under which they occurred this imposes the following constraints upon the interpretation of the New Testament number one the rules of grammar and translation that govern the language number two the particular usage and style of the individual authors must be recognized three the thought world inhabited by the writers must be investigated and for the social circumstances that gave rise to the writing of the text must be explored. So we'll, we'll get on to the influence of Heidegger um, on uh, Bultmann's hermeneutical task, but I just want to throw in a, a few provisos and important thoughts here uh, concerning this exegetical method. I agree I think there are some good points with Bultmann's idea. It is important uh, to get the historical context of a text. Um, that goes without question. To, to look at the grammar, to look at why the writer has written the piece of material, uh, to look at it in its overall cultural context when you look in a passage of the Bible. So I agree with the historical grammatical uh, underpinnings of what Bultmann is saying but the historical grammatical underpinnings are underpinned by some other presuppositions that undermine that actually undermine um, the exegetical task because even though Bultmann says that he pays uh, attention to the historical context, the cultural context and the grammatical context the fact of the matter is his existential philosophy that he has gained from Heidegger and other philosophers becomes the hermeneutical tool within his exegesis so we'll find later on which I'll bring out in more detail later on we find that Heide uh, we find that Bultmann when he's expounding Paul's theology is basically a straitjacket, a hermeneutical straitjacket from Heidegger. So we get certain terms by Paul that Paul uses, uh, theological terms, and those terms are controlled by the philosophical terms of Heidegger that Bultmann smuggles in in his uh, hermeneutical task. The second thing is that. there is a presupposition against propositional revelation the idea that God can speak through words is not a given within this exegetical task so it's not about finding the mind of the author as in i.e. God as well as the natural author of the text but it's more about the existential moment, finding the answer to an existential question at this present time, whatever that might be, and that is the concrete knowledge that we can gain. But that is not what real exegesis is all about. It's, a, it's about coming into contact with an objective text that can give us objective knowledge of God. Now that does not discount the subjectivity or the uh, presuppositional uh, the presuppositional baggage that we bring to a text, or the fact that we we are in uh, a position of learning where we are constantly learning from a text. Th it, that is not discounted. But it's important to recognize, recognize that in the Protestant evangelical tradition, we are, ex we are studying an objective text, a text that speaks to us of God and a text by God objectively who's worked in history and has inspired propositional revelation uh, 
that has been recorded and so therefore it is uh, behoven on us to look at that text and to study it as best we can and to gain a knowledge of what it's saying and so it's not just about asking questions today and how are they answered within the text but it's about finding the mind of the author and how then does that text relate to today so that's a significant difference in uh, her the hermeneutical text than what Heidegger would suggest and also I think and, and what that means is that we can know truth we can know God we're not going to know him in in his fullness because he's infinite but we can not we can have knowledge of God we can have knowledge of the truth it doesn't mean to say that the truth is exhaustive because we're only finite we're only limited and we continue to learn but well, that mm -hmm. truth is there irrespective of whether I bring a background to the text or not. Now, that is a significantly different, different understanding of hermeneutics than Bultmann and I think much of modern scholarship today. I must reiterate, and I must reiterate this as a very important point in the hermeneutical task because I can hear the clamors of the feminist theologians and all the other theologians that are around today that you're just simply discounting you're just ignoring the fact of what Bultmann is saying that we are engaged in an experience and as our experience connects with the experience of the past we can have a new experience today but you're forgetting that it is an experience today of ourselves that brings to the exegetical task a continual circularity of information as they both interact with each other your experience with the experience of the text one doesn't disagree with this one does not deny this there is a constant communication between ourselves and the text there is no doubt about that but the text is objective and that's the point the text is God move, who has come and spoken into the historical time frame of our existence objectively speaking and there is the problem with modern hermeneutical methods it is really in a cycle of subjectivity whereas Protestant dogmatics is in a cycle of objectivity with subjective reflection in other words we come with our own experiences but we come to the objective word of God that has spoken to us in time and in history what are the implications of that well what that means is you end up then if you take that kind of hermeneutical method that I'm expounding that was expounded by Adel Schlatter and so those who are theologians today would do well to go and study the paper and the writings on hermeneutics by Adel Schlatter what that means is you're going to pay much more important um, work to the exegetical task than you've ever done <coughs> and you're going to make sure that you allow the author to speak and make sure that your presuppositions are pushed to the side as best you can to allow the text to speak for itself that is what John Calvin did and there was a mighty revolution it's what the Renaissance actually did the Renaissance actually promoted the kind of hermeneutics that I'm trying to t tell you about once we get into the kind of Heidegger into the Rudolf Bultmann kind of hermeneutical task he says it is objective and subjective but ultimately it's just subjective but all you end up doing is exegeting a God of your own image God becomes your little 
eisegesis rather than exegesis. That is to say that you take a text and you're just making God in your own image. It's all about you and about what you think. It's not about the objective God who has spoken to you objectively in his word. Those are my initial thoughts uh, on Boltman's hermeneutics there. Hermeneutics is a very, very difficult task, a very, very difficult uh, to deal with uh, philosophically. Uh, but I'm trying to give you pointers to move in a different direction than our modern academic world is going in concerning hermeneutics and has been going in for about 30 or 40 years. I'm trying to encourage you to move the other direction and move over to Adolf Schlatter uh, rather than the Boltman program. So now we're going to look at uh, Boltman and his influence by Heidegger. Uh, Martin Heidegger, 1889 to 1976. Uh, Ferguson said is one of the most important and difficult 20th century philosophers. For the purpose of understanding his influence about Boltman, it will be sufficient to confine our attention to his time and being. And so I'll stop there. Time and being is basically saying, uh, so I think, um, that we become authentic human beings as we act. That That's as best as I can um, answer, that it is not about the Cartesian uh, project. If you remember Descartes, I think therefore I am. Uh, what that project was is that ontologically, ont ontology means being. The project is that ontologically there is an a, a, an objective being of a human and an objective being of a God and it, and it is this ontological knowledge that allows us then to gain general knowledge of our surroundings so so I'll say that again the Cartesian project the project of Descartes is basically uh, the human condition as ontological status that is the human being has an a being an objective being and God has an objective being and Heidegger turned this on its head and said no it's not ontological being it's it's not a uh, a static a static aspect of what it is to be human or, or to, to be God it is more in action and the action of a moment that is what it is to be a, a human being. And so we read we read these words. Um, I'll just read a few of these words here. <clears throat> so this is from Being in Time, page 100. This is Heidegger, Being in Time, page 100. If its kind of being as ready to hand is disregarded, this nature itself can be discovered and defined simply in its pure present at hand. When this happens, the nature which stirs and strives, which assails us and enthralls us as a landscape, remains hidden. The botanist plants are not the flowers of the hedgerow, the source which the geographer establishes for a river is not the springhead in the dale. Page 61, Ferguson says, The being of Dasein is manifest in the phenomenon of care or sorge. Care or concern is one of the fundamental features of Dasein and distinguishes human existence from the reality belonging to the entities. Dasein is an entity for which, in its being, that being is an issue. In the phenomenon of care, other structures of human existence are brought to light. Dasein is fundamentally being in the world. It is being which is situated in a world of things and other persons. Dasein belongs inextricably to a material and social world. The world is a place in which I find myself bound up in a network of relations with things and people. Material objects are known primarily as items of equipment which determine my practical concern and other persons are with those whom I share in the world. It's, it kind of sounds like an existential pragmatist really so there is a hiddenness in this knowledge of the hermeneutical task from Heidegger's perspective as well is that we we don't fully 
get to know the subject or the uh, the object there is an unveiling um, Ferguson writes human existence is not fixed and determined it contains potential and possibility here the relationship of being to time is crucial for Heidegger truth is not primarily a property belonging to propositions that accurately mirror external realities truth in its more ancient sense is the uncovering of what previously lies concealed uh, Magda King writes, whereas traditional philosophy has for long regarded the proposition as the primary locus of truth, Heidegger shows it is too to be a far off derivative of original truth whose locus is the existential continuation of man's being and care. And then in page 63 of Ferguson, understanding for Heidegger is a basic mode of existence rather than intellectual grasp of ideas. which to me is a contradiction by the way and so I uh, so Rudolf Bultmann takes Schleimacher he takes uh, other philosophers but he takes Heidegger and he applies Heidegger to the hermeneutical task Heidegger, it must always remember, was always primarily influenced by Wilhelm Hermann. So always remember that. That he was influenced by Wilhelm Hermann principally, who was a, a die in the wool liberal. But un encrusted into this hermeneutical task, which was influenced by liberalism, was this sprinkling of Heidegger. So Heidegger's philosophy, says Ferguson, page 65, was in many ways another catalyst that Bultmann was waiting for and their collaboration in Magba during the 1920s 20s left a permanent mark on all Bultmann's theological writing. Bultmann says, I found in it conceptuality in which it is possible to speak adequately of human existence and therefore also of the existence of the believer. So Heidegger, uh, Bultmann applying Heidegger fell into a discourse and debate with Karl Barth. Karl Barth said we shouldn't use philosophy in theology and Bultmann said well we should, we can't escape it. And I just want to read one last quote, page um, H.G. Gadamer, Truth and Method, page 296. And, and this is the conclusion from Gadamer's Truth and Method. The presupposition that one is moved by the question of God already involves a claim to knowledge concerning the true God and his revelation. Even unbelief is defined in terms of the faith that is demanded of one. The existential for understanding which is Bultmann's starting point can only be a Christian one. So Gadamer in Truth of Method basically is criticizing Bultmann by saying, look, all this subjectivity that you're saying, all this subjectivity about God that is in the moment presupposes the Christian God anyway. <coughs> now, I'm not going to go into it here, but just to say that there were certain philosophical categories that Heidegger had. Two, two or three very important principles. And Bultmann took those principles and imposed them, imposed the Heideggerian hermeneutical method, imposed them on his exegesis of the New Testament. And so he didn't allow, actually, the New Testament to fully speak for itself. But his Heideggerian philosophy 
um, trammeled that interpretation and, and that has become one of the main critiques of Bultmann today in the academic world. Uh, so that's the hermeneutical task and uh, if you want to look at hermeneutics and study it in I would encourage you to go to Dr. Bob Hutley's website. If you type in Dr. Bob Hutley uh, free commentaries uh, and you go on his site, you will find um, a couple of books that you could download for free on hermeneutics. And those books are absolutely brilliant. And you can listen to his lectures and you'll find them stimulating and you'll find them helpful to develop uh, your hermeneutical skills in the studying of the scriptures. Uh, for those who are more philosophically minded, uh, I would encourage you to, if you want to de think uh, from a more philosophical, academic point of view, I'd encourage you to read uh, from a church perspective, I'd encourage you to read uh, the history of hermeneutics, especially the area of Alex the Alexandrian and the Antioch school. So try and find some literature on the Antioch and the uh, Alexandrian school of the early church. Also uh, on hermeneutics in modern uh, academic scene, uh, Racour, uh, French philosopher and uh, specialist in hermeneutics, uh, has written, wrote quite a bit on this subject. Uh, Racour is perhaps one of the leading, has been one of the leading thinkers on hermeneutics. Uh, I would not agree with him, but if you want to think about it at the high echelons of academia, uh, Racour is a place, a French philosopher, that you would do well to read. Uh, on reading text, the deconstructionist um, um, just trying to think uh, just slipped my head uh, deconstructionist I should, Derrida yeah sorry I'm just, I'm just a bit tired Derrida um, is a guy who's written quite a, wrote quite a lot on hermeneutics and uh, reading text then you got Raku for myself I would encourage the, those are those are kind of stuff that you can look at academically. There's also a course at Yale University that you can go to uh, on literary theory and looks at uh, a whole bag and range of hermeneutical methods of understanding the text. And that's at Yale University. Uh, if you go on YouTube, Yale University, look at uh, just type in. Uh, Liter uh, 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 literature course and you'll find a course on how to interpret text and there it looks at uh, neo-pragmatism it looks at deconstructionism and it looks at, at a whole lot of uh, various hermeneutical methods um, but I would also say that for me um, having looked at these modern understandings of hermeneutics I would encourage you to go back to Adolf Schlatter. You can read his paper on hermeneutics. Uh, if you type in Adolf Schlatter on hermeneutics, you'll be able to get his paper. And uh, also have a read of his works and look at how he does hermeneutics. And that is the way modern scholarship in philosophy, in theology needs to go. It needs to go back to the Adolf Schlatter way of doing uh, hermeneutics, basically. And you as a theologian, if you're a theologian, if you're a bishop, or if you're a pastor, you need to go back to that method. And uh, Ad uh, Dr. Bob Utley uh, has written a, a wonderful book on hermeneutics that will uh, supply you with the actual tools of expounding the Bible. So those are the two recommendations, Dr. Bob Utley and Adel Schlatter, that I give you. But I put you on to some more philosophical material if you want to read widely, okay, uh, Derrida, Raku, uh, etc. There's a nice little uh, lecture on neo-pragmatism on the Yale University YouTube site and the, the two neo-pragmatists I mentioned there, you can download the paper 
uh, on hermeneutics from a neo pragmatist point of view. Uh, so, yeah, just a, a little aside if you want to look at how to do expository uh, hermeneutics and you want good models, I would suggest from a preaching point of view John MacArthur. John Piper, R.C. Spruill, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, these are excellent people that you can type in, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones Recording Trust, uh, go to there, you can go on the website and you'll find excellent uh, preaching the, and his preaching will show you how to expand a text. And John MacArthur is an excellent Bible teacher, look at him and you'll see how to expand a text from John MacArthur's perspective. So. That's uh, on hermeneutics. Okay. Now we come to um, well, we've covered quite a lot of ground, even in the hermeneutics. So I think what we'll do now is we'll we'll just quickly go through uh, some of I think we spent quite a bit of time on his hermeneutics there, and I think I think that is actually the key, really, to be honest, with Boltman. But there's so much that we could go through. Um, anyhow, let's let's look at what he says concerning Jesus. Uh, page 73 of Ferguson book. Boltman says this: I do indeed think that we can know almost nothing concerning the life and personality of Jesus, since the early Christian sources show no interest in either. Uh, are more fragmentary and often legendary and other sources about Jesus do not exist. So that's Boltman on the life of Jesus. Now we have to remember that when Boltman says we can't know anything about Jesus ultimately, generally speaking, he does not say that we can't know anything about Jesus. This is a very important point with Boltman. I, I disagree with the guy but this is a, a very important point with Boltman. Boltman, even though he's saying we, we can't know much about Jesus, he's not saying we can't know anything about Jesus. And so Boltman, to his credit, or even though I disagree with him in his in his philosophy and theology and whatever, to his credit, uh, he would spend a lot of time in his form criticism trying to find uh, historical information about Jesus. And if you look at his... Hiya Mark, you alright? Hey brother. How are you hey, doing? Are you clear? You alright? You alright? I'm, I'm just doing Rudolf Bultman. <laughs> alright. I'm on a Google Hangout. I'm doing Rudolf Bultman part two. I've just done his hermeneutics. Should we listen in then? Are you sure? Yeah, go on. We're listening. Well, I was just saying right. that this is what he says about Jesus. Right. I do indeed think that we can know almost nothing concerning the life of personality of Jesus since the early Christian sources show no interest in either or moreover fragmentary and often legendary, legendary and other sources about Jesus do not exist. And what I was saying is uh, uh, on two fronts just to start with that he basically um, even though he's saying we can't know much he did believe we can know something and he did write a magnum opus book on the Gospel of John where he did intricate detailed analysis of various texts to try and find something about Jesus but mm -hmm. uh, modern scholarship has completely turned around Boltman now so uh, modern scholarship would say that we can know a lot about Jesus uh, because the sources are more earlier than Boltman would have us to believe so I'll only do this for five more minutes and then I'll pull it off and we can chat, guys. No, you like Jay, take as long as you can, mate. Um, all I was saying that Boltman, uh, in his hermeneutical method, he, he used a German philosopher called uh, Heidegger and Heidegger's philosophy. And so when Boltman was expounding the Bible, and trying to look at what the Bible was saying or the New Testament, he was actually he wasn't actually listening to the Bible. He was influenced by Heidegger's philosophy. So when he's expounding Paul, mm. he's actually expounding 
Heidegger's philosophy, not Paul. And uh, so, um, Bultmann's understanding of the New Testament is basically. Uh, I'll just finish with this and then I'll, I'll close and just say where where things are at. Um, basically, Bultmann's project is saying that the first century Jews and the first century Jesus and all the rest of it is not the same as our culture. We're scientific, we're modern, and so that means miracles can't happen. And so we're not to take it seriously when we read the New Testament. You know, it's an, it's a it's a bygone age. And so what we've got to do is we've got to just strip it of all its legend and all its myth and all the rest of it and get to the basic core of who Jesus may be. And then when we read the text, we have questions for today about our own existence. And as we read the text of these little bits of historical Jesus that we can find through all the legend, then that is really the, the core of what it's all about. And the whole problem with that is um, it just discounts the supernatural. It's prejudice against the supernatural. And science isn't prejudiced against the supernatural. In quantum physics, I don't know much about quantum physics, but in quantum physics, in, in, in the time of Kant and Hume, they believe, they believe generally, not Hume, but just before Hume, they believe that an event had a cause and effect and it was applied to miracles they said like nature affects nature so nothing supernatural breaks through it but in the 20 in 1920s they discovered quantum mechanics and what they realized is nature's in deep down is much more complex and they don't fully understand what goes on so the quantum issue means that you've always got to be open something could happen in nature that you've not accounted for and that's why science developed probability that we can only be probable about certain things what all this means is that quantum mechanics uh, and stuff like that basically means that science is open to the miraculous it's not against the miraculous something could always break in into the historical flaw that science has not accounted for because it doesn't fully understand what goes on at the quantum level and that means when you look at history you should be open to whether miracles have taken place or not you should look at all the the only way to discount a miracle is to look at the evidence not to push it out beforehand and say science discards it and so you get an example where David Hume um, he said that he had five, five criteria for examining miracles and he began to examine the French Catholics and this is a skeptic and he it was uh, Pascal and his friends they had all the all the people were getting healing in the aristocracy in France in the 1600s oh. and David Hume he was in the 1700s he went back and read the papers and the testimonies and he said, according to my criteria, my five criteria, these miracles took place. But then he said, but just, but they didn't take place because miracles don't happen. But the point being that if you actually look at the evidence like Hume did, and you look at the historical evidence, you can get evidence that the miracles took place. But the reason why people reject miracles is not because of the evidence, it's because they push it out prior before saying science discounts it but science doesn't and so that was the problem with with Rudolf Bultmann he's mm. saying the Bible's full of legend not because he's proved it in evidence is he's, dis he's, he's just discounted the supernatural by a prior belief in science which is misplaced and with that will end Bultmann <laughs> so there we are so basically, just stick to your Bible, guys. And it, <laughs> yeah, <nice. laughs> stick to the Bible. Stick to the Word of God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hey, I was in Manchester today preaching. Woo! -hoo! How are you Hiya. doing? Yeah. How are you doing? What's been happening? If we're good. We're good. We can't okay. see you though. We've just got this guy with a wig on again. I know. I'll turn it off in a minute, and I'll. I'll uh, <laughs>
I'll say goodbye to the viewers in a sec, but oh, I'll tell you what, <laughs> I was in Manchester today preaching, right? I was preaching on hell. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but I was saying, I was going on, I was saying, I was saying, uh, when you see preachers with boards with hell on, you think, oh, it's control, they're trying to put fear into you. And I said, uh, you know, when you hear about hell, you think, oh, it's about fear. I said, but hell, all hell is about, if you don't believe in hell, you don't believe in the holiness of God. You don't believe in sin. And people were listening. They were really yeah. listening. And I, I preached for about an hour, and then I was giving out tracts, and near the end of the day, about 4 o'clock, someone gave me a bottle of water, I drank it, and I went to go and put it in the bin. And it was a five-minute walk from where I were where I was and this um, elderly lady came up to me and she said I can't speak I can't speak if I speak I'll start crying she said but I heard you earlier today preaching he yeah. said she said uh, keep preaching but if I talk about it I'll, I'll start crying you know that's awesome Jim yeah I know I thought whoa so as soon as she walked off yeah. As soon as she... Oh, that again? Tell Claire, say that again, Jay. I was saying, Claire. <laughs> there was this woman with three big ears. <laughs> I'm doing emails, I'm working, yeah. Six eyes <laughs> and fangs as big as a, a Dracula, <laughs> no. No, you words. <laughs> no, I was preaching on hell, right? And then later on in the day, near the end of the day, I had this bottle of water, I drank it and went to put it in the bin and it was quite a walk away from where I was so I got there so I'm away from where I was preaching quite a way <laughs> and um, this old woman come up to me and she just said to me um, just trying to remember she just said um, I was walking past and I just I heard what you said and I can't speak now because if I speak about it i.e. what she heard me preaching if I speak about it I'll just start crying Oh. And she said, just keep on doing what you're doing. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. And then she said it again, I, I can't speak about it. I can't speak about it. I'll start yeah. crying. Uh, How old was she, Jay? About oh, 60 or 65. 70. That's awesome, that, Jay. She looked like yeah. Ilda Rogdon, you know. She was all right. Yeah. yeah. So, I, and, and so as soon as she's done that, I thought, wow, I was really encouraged. So... I was knackered and I was ready for going on, but I went back to where I was, start giving it. As I was giving out tracks, I was just preaching out. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't preach on hell that time. I was oh, just preaching really? on hell. I was just going, yeah. I was just going yeah. hallelujah, here's the tracks. You know, yeah. I've done more street preaching than you, don't have your day. Yeah. I used to do it when I was getting Christian, you haven't. No. <laughs> I, I had a young lad as well. I had some 15-year-old kids, you know, come. And... Um, they come up to me like they look like grammar school kids and this this young lad like he says I'm gay will gays go to heaven you know yeah. and I said mate I said D you know Jesus loves you and, and I said he died for you you know he really really died for you and he loves you he said yes I know but well well if if I if will I will I will gays go to go to heaven and I said well if they believe in Jesus he says oh Oh, I can be gay and go to heaven then. I said, no, let me explain. Look, I said, when you believe in Jesus, he becomes your king. And I pointed to his head. I said, see, you, see your nose. You're the king of your nose. You're the king of your lips. And he went, what do you mean? I said, well, you can do whatever you want with your nose. Go wherever you want. Smell whatever you want. With your mouth, you can smell whatever you want. I said, and with your sex organs, you can do what you want. Yeah, you're the king of that. I said, but when you believe in Jesus, he's the king of your nose, he's the king of your money, he's the king of your sex organs. So when you believe in Jesus, you, you come into line with him, and he's the king. And I said, you know, I said, I struggle with sex. I said, I have, like, my, my struggles, but Jesus is my king, and I want to follow him. I said, you've got your struggles. I said, I'm not saying it's going to be easy if you become a Christian, but... Christ wants you to move his way, not your way. I said, and it's, I said I've said, i never met a, 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 whole, a gay person. I said, I've never met a gay person yet who's been able to give me an intellectual defense of being gay. 
I said, it's not intellectual defense. You, you're gay because you feel it, and I understand that. You feel it passionately, you know, and, and I get that. I said, but if it's going to be the truth, it's got to be of the mind and of the heart, and yours is of the heart. I said, and I can prove to you that Jesus lived, he died, and he rose again. That's the head. I said, and then the heart is he'll come in and, he'll, and, he, and he meets with you and he changes you. I said, you've just got the heart. You feel this way. I said, but it's about coming in line with Christ and trusting in him because he's the truth. And he'll Ooh. change you. It won't be easy. And he said, so as, so he said, um, well, he said, so... Um, so is that what the Bible teaches? I said, well, you can either be, I said, you can either be a trendy vicar who says that bit in the Bible's okay, but that bit in the Bible's not. I said, but at the end of the day, either the Bible's the word of God or it's not. And he said, yeah. And he and he said, if it's the Bible, you got to follow it, aren't you? I said, yeah. And he said, the Bible doesn't teach it, does it? I said, yeah, that's right. He said, oh, I get it now, right? Thank you. And he said, I'm going to think about it. You know, yeah. so, so he knew that he was loved by God, but he knew yeah. what, he knew God's standard. And I tried to communicate him that I struggle, so I'm not trying to judge him. Yeah. But that if he becomes a believer, if he's if he is gay and he becomes a believer, that he will he might struggle, he'd probably struggle. Yeah. He'd find it difficult. But I said yeah. so I communicated that to him, so but that he was, sounds great, that Jay. But he was a delight. He was a lovely guy. You know, he's a lovely little guy. Yeah. So if you could pray for him, he was really nice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's great, actually. So that's it. So I've had a great day. Yeah. Good. Good stuff. And, uh, but yeah, that's nothing else to report, really. Just uh, preach just preached for about two hours and just gave uh, leaflets out and stuff and had lots yeah. of good conversations and stuff and uh, Moab and Roxana came just popped in to say oh they just live down the road there Iranians oh yeah <coughs> and uh, yeah so great stuff Jay awesome brother they've got a good looking cousin there as well she was, really oh, like. <laughs> she was good looking. I was looking at her ads if she had a ring on her fingers or whatever. <laughs> I said, you'll have to come for tea. <laughs> she bought a suitcase, this cousin. It was the biggest suitcase you'd ever see. It looked, I'm not kidding. It looked like... It, it was massive. It looked what like two... I don't know. They just bought it. No, she just bought it. Oh, right. I said, right. what have you bought that for? You're going around the world twice or something, I said. <laughs> Um. Yeah, yeah. It's been a good day. It was nice. I, I really enjoy going out preaching and sharing the gospel. I enjoyed it in Liverpool. I was preaching in Liverpool the other day, and uh, outside McDonald's, <coughs> and this woman stopped and was listening. Mm. She came up to me. She says, "Oh, you don't need a mic, do you?" I know. <laughs> and that, then she walked off, and she talked to David. She started talking to David. And then I went up to David and he, and he said, oh, she's a, a Roman Catholic, and she, but she doesn't understand the gospel, and she's really interested, you know. So you get these you get these little encouragements. You think you're banging against your head against the wall, you know, but God encourages you. Yeah. That's awesome, that, Jay. Yeah. It's great stuff. Yeah. So... Have you finished your garden now? I'm going to finish now. So, yes. folks... Thank you for listening. This is Jay Ball <laughs> signing out to all fans out there. Behave yourself because I'll be watching <laughs> you. I'll be watching you. God bless everybody. Just having a bit of fun. Take care. And uh, any atheist out there who keeps saying hermeneutics, it's not hermeneutics, it's hermeneutics. Okay? <laughs> hermeneutics. Come on now. Take care. Yeah. God bless. <laughs>